Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. In the knowledge series, we aim to cover 100 important topics for your upcoming mains and as well as to help those aspirants who are preparing for the 2023 attempt. Apart from this, we also have the target mains program that is running exclusively on the Baiju's exam prep app. So those of you who are preparing for this year's mains, do download the app and take part in these sessions to improve your answer writing skills and to revise all the important topics for your mains. So if you're liking all these initiatives, if you're benefiting from them, do let us know by pressing the like button, share these videos with your fellow aspirants and without fail, subscribe to our channel. So let's start with today's session of knowledge series. Today again, we have taken a topic from international relations and we are going to discuss a very, very important regional grouping that is the ASEAN. The ASEAN stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's one of the most important regional groupings in the world because the ASEAN has emerged as the central pillar of the Asian economy. This grouping was established in the year 1967 during the heights of the Cold War. During the Cold War era, even the Southeast Asian countries, they were divided between the Western countries and the Communist power bloc. A few countries which were either non-aligned or those who were aligned with Western countries, essentially those who were opposed to communism, they came together to form a political and economic grouping called the ASEAN in 1967 by signing the Bangkok Declaration. Please make a note of this point, it can be important for prelims. By signing the Bangkok Declaration in 1967, a few Southeast Asian countries established this grouping called the ASEAN. Later, many other countries joined the grouping as well. And today, there are 10 Southeast Asian nations that are part of this important regional grouping. So if you ask me what exactly is ASEAN, it is essentially a political and economic grouping of 10 important Southeast Asian countries. This grouping was founded by countries such as Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Malaysia. In 1967, these were the countries that were either aligned with West, with the Western countries or they were non-aligned. For example, Indonesia was non-aligned. It was one of the founders of non-aligned movement along with India. Other countries like Singapore and Philippines, they were clearly aligned with the Western countries. So in order to create a front against communism, these five Southeast Asian countries, they signed the Bangkok Declaration and they founded this grouping called the ASEAN. After the Cold War ended, after the region started integrating together, five more countries of the region, that is Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Brunei and even Myanmar, they all joined this grouping eventually in the 1990s, that is after the end of the Cold War. So from 1990s, the ASEAN has become a predominant political economic organization that is focused on this region, the Southeast Asia region. Now, what is so important about Southeast Asia? The most significant fact about Southeast Asia is that it lies at the center of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. It lies at the very heart of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and it plays a determining role in the Indo-Pacific region. So a political economic group, grouping that dominates Southeast Asia is naturally expected to play an important role in the Asian economy and as well as in the global economy. Today ASEAN has moved beyond its economic role and it is also playing a strategic role in the Indo-Pacific. So that is what makes ASEAN so very important and we should also understand why this grouping is significant for India. Why is ASEAN such an important grouping for India and for our exams? See, the Southeast Asia region that you just saw in the map, which includes the 10 Southeast Asian countries, it represents a population of nearly 662 million people. This region accounts for nearly $3.2 trillion of the global GDP. According to latest estimates, this has gone up to $4 trillion. That is the Southeast Asia region which basically comprises of the ASEAN members. It accounts for nearly $4 trillion of the global GDP. These countries have become significant economic powerhouses on their own. For example, a country like Singapore, it's a free market economy and 
it has emerged as a leader in services and in the financial industry right countries like thailand indonesia philippines and vietnam they've all registered significant growth they powered the rise rise of the asian powers in the 1990s they've built a strength in manufacturing they have become stronger in agriculture and food processing countries like vietnam especially they have registered tremendous growth over the last few years and it has emerged as a technology hub and a startup hub of the region so that is why the asean region is so very important and along with these economic prospects india also shares very close cultural historical and civilizational links with this region if you go back to the ancient medieval times several kingdoms like the cholas they extended their influence across today's southeast asia the cholas pallavas and the others they had their influence in today's indonesia thailand in today's singapore region cambodia in all these places the influence of the indian civilization was clearly seen and that is why even today you find a very strong cultural connect between india and southeast asia this group like i mentioned it has become a central pillar of the asian economy especially since 1990s and it has provided for the economic integration of the region the asean has brought together a diverse set of countries now if you look at the members again it has countries like indonesia and malaysia which are muslim majority countries it has countries like myanmar which is a buddhist majority country it has countries like singapore and vietnam which are religiously diverse there are few countries which are politically autocratic and dictatorial like myanmar for example which has been under military rule there are few countries which are open democracies like singapore right so if you look at the political structure the religious profile the ethnic profile these countries the 10 members of asean they are very diverse they are very different from each other and yet this grouping is what holds them together since they have a few common political and economic objectives they come together despite their differences and diversity and they have formed one of the strongest regional groupings in the world together they have set up a free trade area the asean free trade area which was signed in 1992 and through this they have created a single market that promotes free trade it pro it has provided for free movement of goods services and investment amongst the asean countries so even though individually these countries are small even though these countries on their own are very small economies when they come together collectively under the asean they become a economic powerhouse that is what makes asean so significant so very important in the global economy and as well as for india because southeast asia region is a part of india's extended neighborhood right we actually share land boundaries and maritime boundaries with some of these countries so this explains the significance of asean for india and also in 1995 the asean group even declared the southeast asia region as a nuclear weapon free zone these countries are committed towards nuclear disarmament and they signed the southeast asian nuclear weapon free zone treaty so this shows that the asean countries have not limited their collaboration to economic domain they even collaborate in the areas of strategic issues geopolitical issues and political issues of the region so asean today has not only become the central pillar of the asian economy but it is emerging as a leader of the indo pacific region itself in fact asean has signed six other free trade agreements with important powers of the region it has established a dialogue partner status with key asian powers with key powers in the indo pacific and with six major countries it has signed separate free trade agreements including one with india it has signed ftas with china japan south korea australia and new zealand which are also part of the pacific and as well as with india so these are six major economies of the indo pacific and with all the six major countries asean has a separate fta and apart from this recently in 2020 asean became a part of rcep the regional comprehensive economic partnership which has emerged as the world's largest free trade agreement the rcep it was a free trade negotiation that was being led by china these negotiations were going on from 2012 in fact even india was a part of rcep negotiations 
India along with Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand and all the ASEAN countries. These 16 countries together were part of RCEP negotiations. But India due to differences, it quit RCEP negotiations but ASEAN countries are part of it. They are part of the world's largest free trade agreement. So all these factors, these political, economic and strategic factors, they make ASEAN a very, very important organization as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. It is in this context that we need to understand India's relations with ASEAN. What is our priority in the ASEAN region or in the Southeast Asia region? What kind of relations do we have with, the, with this group and with these countries? So you need to have a basic understanding so that you'll be able to answer any question either in prelims or in mains. See, India's relationship with ASEAN is the central pillar of our look east, act east policy. Some of you might have heard about India's look east policy, which today has been upgraded to the act east policy of India. India launched the look east policy back in 1992 under the then PV Narasimha Rao government. There was a reason why India launched the look east policy. Under the look east policy, India was trying to revive its historical, cultural and economic relations with its eastern neighbors. The focus of look east was on Southeast Asia region and as well as East Asia region, which until then was largely neglected by India. Until the end of the Cold War, until 1992, India was largely preoccupied with its immediate neighborhood with our neighboring countries like China, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. We were largely occupied with global powers like US, Russia and European countries. We had never paid enough attention to other countries in Africa, in Asia and in Latin America. So in 1991-1992, there were few major developments that took place. One was the end of the Cold War. As the Cold War came to an end, India lost a key ally in the form of Soviet Union. The Soviet Union disintegrated. So India lost a key partner and India felt that it needed new diplomatic relations. It needed new friends so that India could have ba enough backing at international platforms. So that is when the PV Narasimha Rao government decided to diversify India's foreign policy. During the same period, we faced an internal economic crisis. India faced a balance of payment crisis which eventually pushed India to introduce the LPG reforms. That is the liberalization, privatization, globalization reforms. So as India was opening up its economy, India needed new invest investments. We needed to attract more foreign investments. And along with that, we needed new markets where our goods could be exported. So this was a top priority for India and it became a priority for Indian diplomacy. On one hand, we needed new friends and new partners because Soviet Union had disintegrated. And on the other hand, we were facing an internal economic crisis. We had just opened up our economy. So we desperately needed foreign investments and foreign markets where our goods could be exported. It was in this context that the Narasimha Rao government launched the ambitious look east policy to pay attention to Southeast Asia and East Asia region. So India has gotten close to the Southeast Asian and East Asian countries under the look east policy. Many major initiatives have been taken up and this policy is primarily driven by our relationship with the ASEAN regional grouping. Recently in 2014, Prime Minister Modi upgraded the look east policy of India into the act east policy of India. Even under the act east policy, the ASEAN happens to be the central pillar. It drives India's equation with the Southeast Asia region. If you look at the history of India-ASEAN relations, it was in 1992 that India established a sectoral dialogue with ASEAN group when we launched the look east policy of India. Within a few years, India became a full dialogue partner and a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum or ARF, which is a much larger group that is led by ASEAN. The 10 ASEAN countries, they bring together around 27 countries from Asia to form the ASEAN Regional Forum. India is also a full-time member and a dialogue partner to the ASEAN Regional Forum. This forum plays a critical role in discussing political, security and economic issues of the Asia region, of the Indo-Pacific region. Since 2002, India and ASEAN have been holding annual summit 
they are, they are having an annual summit level interaction where the leaders of these countries interact every year. Now, I am stressing on these points because 2022 marks the 30th anniversary of establishment of relations between India and ASEAN. We have chosen this topic for discussion today because just last week, just a few days back, the foreign ministers of India and ASEAN countries have met to mark and commemorate the 30th anniversary of India-ASEAN relations. So naturally, it's going to be an important topic for UPSC exams. So please note that every year, the leaders of these countries meet and they have a summit level interaction where they discuss all key areas of collaboration. India has also become a member of ADMM Plus, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. See, ASEAN countries, they focus not just on political and economic issues, they also focus on defense and security issues. So to coordinate their security policy, ASEAN countries have a platform called ADMM, where the defense ministers of ASEAN countries meet and interact. Following this ADMM meeting, the ASEAN has another meeting called ADMM Plus, which includes India, US, Russia, China, Japan, Australia, South Korea, all these major powers of the region are also included under ADMM Plus, through which ASEAN countries focus on military and security uh, aspects of the Indo-Pacific region. So India regularly participates in ADMM Plus meetings and it's a very important platform to focus on maritime security. So this is why our ties with ASEAN is so important. This is not just about our political and economic relations. There is tremendous scope for India to expand its cultural strategic relations as well with ASEAN and this allows India to exercise influence in a critical part of the Indo-Pacific. That is why India pursued a free trade agreement with ASEAN. India actively pursue, pursued a free trade agreement and we signed the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement which provides for free trade in goods, services and investments. These negotiations were opened back in 2003. India and ASEAN, they agreed to put in place a free trade agreement and the negotiations began in 2003. Finally, after several rounds of negotiations, the free trade agreement on trade in goods was signed in 2009, which became operational in 2010. So initially, India and ASEAN created a free market to promote the free movement of goods. The idea was to promote the export of agricultural products and manufactured commodities. Within a few years, we even signed a separate agreement to cover services and investments. This has provided for the free flow of services and investments between India and ASEAN. So essentially, India and ASEAN have put in place a full-fledged free trade agreement that has increased the bilateral trading volume and in the recent years, it has crossed $85 billion. This is the bilateral trading volume between India and the ASEAN region. It is anywhere between 85 to $90 billion. And this makes ASEAN the fourth largest trading partner for India after US, China and the European Union. This is where the significance of ASEAN lies. It's a major economic powerhouse and our relations with ASEAN is critical for India. This has helped India find new markets for its exports. India's agri-exports, India's exports from the MSME sector, India's industrial exports have gone up to this region because there exists a huge market. We have been able to attract a lot of investments as well into India and especially we have been able to drive a link with Northeast of India and the Southeast Asian countries. This is one of the priorities of our Look East policy and Act East policy. The idea is to turn Northeast of India into a bridge that connects India with Southeast Asia and drives investments from Southeast Asia into Northeast of India. So all these objectives are being achieved and even though the FTA with ASEAN has a few issues, it has a few drawbacks because the FTA has led to a flood of cheap imports into the Indian market which has affected our domestic producers. But despite these shortcomings, India-ASEAN relationship is critical because today ASEAN has emerged as our fourth largest trading partner and more importantly, we have built very strong and very close defense and strategic relations. Today, India-ASEAN countries, they focus extensively on maritime security. 
India has displayed more boldness on defense and strategic issues under its Actis policy. We hold a number of military exercises and training exercises with the Southeast Asian countries. For example, with countries like Vietnam, then with Indonesia, then even with Thailand, Myanmar, and as well as with Singapore, India has very close military relations. We even supply military equipment and spare parts and components to Vietnam. We conduct frequent military exercises with all these countries that I have listed over here. And in Indonesia, India has gotten access to a naval port called the Sabang port. If you open the Southeast Asia map, you can see the Sumatran island of Indonesia. At the northern tip of Sumatran island, there is a strategic naval port of Indonesia called the Sabang port. Indian Navy has got access to Sabang port. Recently, we have signed a logistics exchange agreement with, Viet with Vietnam. This allows the Indian forces and Vietnamese forces to exchange logistics. That is to provide for refueling and resupplies. India has very close relations with Myanmar as well in the military defense domain. We conduct joint exercises. We have even gifted weapons, including a submarine to Myanmar's Navy. Then Singapore relies heavily on India for training its armed forces. Since Singapore is a small city state, it doesn't have enough space to conduct training and exercises. So the pilots and the naval forces of Singapore, they often train in Indian airspace and in uh, Indian waters because of the constraint of space in Singapore. So that is the kind of close defense and strategic relations that India has with ASEAN countries. And today, this has also become a focus area. Previously, the focus was mainly on political and economic relations, as well as on cultural relations. But now the focus has really shifted to the defense and strategic domain as well. That's because India's Indo-Pacific vision and the objectives of its Sagar doctrine, they align with the vision of the ASEAN. Prime Minister Modi launched the Sagar doctrine of India in 2015 that stands for security and growth for all in the region. This is India's Indo-Pacific vision that is focused on Indo-Pacific region. Under this, India is pursuing strategic relations with all the Indo-Pacific countries. And similarly, ASEAN countries also seek out the military support and the military assistance of India. Because they know that India is a nuclear power. It is a major significant military power in the Indo-Pacific. The reason why ASEAN countries seek out uh, assurance from India is because even they feel threatened by the aggressive rise of China. China's aggressive rise, especially in the Indo-Pacific, has been a direct threat to the Southeast Asian countries. China has expanded its influence across the region through its Belt and Road Initiative. It has taken up several strategic projects in the region, and more importantly, it has opened up maritime disputes with these countries in the South China Sea. China has blatantly breached international laws, such as UN clause, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it has picked maritime disputes with Vietnam, with Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, and the others. So naturally, they seek out India's assistance. Now, that is why, for example, recently, Philippines reached out to India and it procured the BrahMos cruise missile from India. I'm sure some of you would have read about this in newspapers. BrahMos was exported to Philippines and Philippines sees this as a, as a deterrent against the Chinese aggression in the region. So with growing alignment between India and ASEAN countries and with growing aggression of China, it's only natural for India and ASEAN countries to work together in the defense and strategic domain. We also collaborate with regard to disaster management because the region is hit by several disasters, including cyclones, tsunamis, earthquakes, etc. Because Southeast Asia, it lies on the Pacific Ring of Fire. And whenever there are major disasters, India provides HADR assistance or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to these countries. In fact, when the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami struck Indonesia and Thailand, even though India itself was severely affected, India provided assistance to Thailand and Indonesia. We even provide assistance to Myanmar even today, whenever there is a major cyclone in the Bay of Bengal. So India has become a leader with regard to providing disaster management assistance and as well as with regard to providing military assurance and military security. 
So this naturally translates into other domains of cooperation as well. And today, India ASEAN are really focused on improving their connectivity and also on reviving their historical cultural relations. Remember when we discussed BIMSTEC in one of the previous sessions, we spoke about a couple of important connectivity projects that India is pursuing with Southeast Asia. This includes the India Myanmar Thailand trilateral highway project. It's a road project. Then we spoke about the Kaladan project, which is a bilateral project between India and Myanmar. It provides for multiple modes of transportation to connect with Myanmar. Then we are also pursuing a railway line to connect India with Myanmar, Thailand and eventually up till Vietnam. It's being referred to as the Delhi Hanoi rail link to connect Delhi with Hanoi via a rail link. The plan is to set up a parallel railway line that runs parallel to the India Myanmar Thailand trilateral highway. So there is extensive focus on such connectivity projects so that Indian markets can be closely linked with Southeast Asian markets. This will specifically benefit Northeast of India to bring economic development, to drive investments and to drive growth, which could also be helpful in tackling the threat of insurgency in Northeast of India. Along with this, we focus on Buddhist diplomacy as well. Like I said, Buddhism is very popular in Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Vietnam, then even in Myanmar and Singapore. So India being the birthplace of Buddhism, it does leverage this, this advantage and it tries to project its Buddhist influence as a part of its soft power diplomacy. Then we also provide a lot of technical assistance to these countries. India provides training, medical support whenever needed, especially during the recent pandemic. We supplied medicines, vaccines, etc. Then India also provides telemedicine or e-medicine and tele-education or e-education services to some of these countries. We provide remote health services and remote education services to some of these countries. We are also helping these countries in space cooperation with Vietnam, Thailand and Indonesia. India is actively working with them to promote their space activities, their outer space activities. And of course, there is a lot of focus on tourism and also to build people to people relations. The idea is to revive the historical civilizational ties that we had with the Southeast Asia region. So it's because of all these factors that ASEAN is such an important grouping for India. And as a result, it's very, very important for your exams as well. So on this note, I would like to conclude my discussion. But before we end, let me show you a couple of questions that have already come from this topic in previous prelims papers. Back in 2011, when UPSC introduced the new prelims format, there were two questions that came on Southeast Asia region. The first question says, Southeast Asia has captivated the attention of global community over space and time as a geostrategically significant region. Which among the following is the most convincing explanation for this global perspective? It was the hot theater during Second World War. Its location between Asian powers, that is India and China. It was the arena of superpower confrontation during the Cold War period. Or is it because its location between Indian and Pacific Oceans and its preeminent maritime character? You need to figure out which of these reasons explains the geostrategic significance of Southeast Asia. If you have understood the session correctly, if you have paid attention, especially at the beginning, you would know the answer and the correct answer is option D. All the other three don't fit the description. That is not why Southeast Asia is strategically significant. It is significant because it lies between the Indian and Pacific Ocean and it predominantly has a maritime character. So th that is why across space and time, Southeast Asia has been geostrategically important. From centuries, Southeast Asia has been a significant region. Coming to the next question, even this was from 2001 paper. With reference to Lukey's policy of India, consider the following statements. I want you to go through the statements, identify the answer and post them in the comment section below. Because we have discussed these points already in our discussion. So please identify the answer, go through the statements once and post your answers in the comment section below. I'll go through the comments as well. So now before we close, let me take all your doubts and questions. First question. Sir, what influence other than trade relations did the Cholas and Pallavas have on Southeast Asia? See, Cholas and Pallavas, they had extensive influence across Southeast Asia. It was not just limited to trade relations. 
they even had political and military influence in fact the cholas they were known for their naval strength the chola empire was predominantly a, a naval empire they even fought wars in in today's southeast asia region the cholas had defeated the sri vijaya empire of indonesia today if you find strong hindu and buddhist influence across southeast asia a large part of the credit goes to the cholas and pallavas so they extended their cultural influence their political and military influence and they dominated the trade routes in fact the strait of malacca near singapore at one point was dominated by by the cholas and pallavas they were using these trade links to even trade with the song dynasty of china we had very good relations with the song dynasty both in the economic domain and as well as in the military domain the cholas and the song dynasty they were collaborating in naval technology they were tackling piracy near singapore near the strait of malacca so that is the kind of extensive historical ties we had with southeast asia and as well as with china and a large part of the credit goes to the cholas and the pallavas next question what can bimstech learn from asean in order to increase its influence see asean even though it has a lot of differences within the grouping it has really focused on promoting its economic ties economic integration is what gives rise to growth and development that is what creates a leverage for all the members to stick together because everybody has something to gain or something to lose if the grouping doesn't perform well so in bimstech if you look at bimstech one key lesson that we can draw from asean is that we need to focus on economic integration economic integration will automatically provide for regional integration as well because as your economic growth improves as mutual benefits are derived by all the members it will it will automatically become a buffer it will become a buffer that will prevent the grouping from falling apart or it will prevent the members from moving away from each other so one le key lesson that we can draw from asean that is bimstech can draw from asean is that to focus on economic integration next why do we call our region that is south asia as a subcontinent south asia is a subcontinent primarily because of its peninsular shape next sir are you going to cover brics and sark as well yes definitely we'll cover brics and sark as well next how asean is strategically important for india we just discussed in the in the session asean is strategically important mainly because of its location in the indo pacific and also because of its issues with china got it so these are the questions that were there i think we have answered all of them so with on this note let's end today's session and if you have found it beneficial do let us know by liking the video share your comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel thanks for watching